This is Josh Jelinski, the financial quarterback. We are now on Instagram Live. Uh, Instagram, what is our Instagram handle, Ernesto? We are the financial quarterback. Okay, will you... Um, so give us a call, folks, 800-321-0710, 800-321-0710. So even though lumber steel, all these costs of goods have gone up, you think that's really a function of just supply chain issues. When does that correct itself and we start having the price wars, as you say? Dr. Um. As the, 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 we still have some of these these um, supply chain disruptions with us. Uh, they have not been corrected, but as more people are vaccinated and so forth, more immunities, the supply chains will be uh, reinstituted. And um, uh, once that's the case, um, we're going to be operating with a substantially different degree of technology than we was in than was in place a year ago. Um, the old saying, uh, necessity is the mother of inventions. And in crisis situations like we were in last year, we've seen this in many wartime situations, technology uh, that would have been implemented over the next four or five years are brought forward in time. And so the technology is of a much higher level and um, that means that the productivity gains will be will be larger, and uh, as a result, that will also contribute to the to the lower inflation rate. Individual sectors may have inflation, such as we're seeing in the housing sector, but on balance, the inflation rate is going to be coming down. And there are a couple of uh, indications: the supply chains were the most disrupted. Uh, in the third quarter, and particularly in June, July, and August. And during that uh, three-month time period, the, um, the core inflation rate was, was close to 4% per annum. And in the last three months, we've, we've come down to, to only about 2%. And so uh, as the price wars emerge, um, and as the greater technologies and the higher productivity kick in, I think that this transitory surge in inflation that we're seeing, which is called a base effect inflation, will, will pass away. And when the year is over, I think the inflation rate and the core measures will be under 2%. So if you're building a house, wait till next winter? <laughs> We might have an economic well, I winter. I don't like to, to give advice on individual sectors, um, mainly because um, I think that there are vast regional differences. And um, one of the things that's happening in the United States today is we're seeing a, a, a massive shift of populations yeah. uh, from east and west coast areas into uh, parts of the South and the West. And, um, so yeah, you the, see that with Larry Ellison, are, Larry Ellison just bought an $80 million mansion in Palm beach. He was have said to have gone to Hawaii <laughs> and he was living in Hawaii, but, uh, maybe, maybe not anymore. Yeah. But that in one makes, sense, makes big... that in one sense is a consequence of deflation. Is it not? You have people, not making what they used to, so they they want to move down south and get an instant eight to ten percent bump in their standard of living. Well, I think that, that that's that's part of the motivation. I also think that um, this is a, a little bit tricky economically, but but um, the GDP measure in the current situation. Is, is a flawed measure. Uh, it reflects uh, what, what's known to economists as the fallacy of the broken glass. And um, it's easy to think that if someone throws a rock in, the, in, a, in a window pane of a, of a shop, that that will boost the GDP because the shop owner has to um, 
you know, replace the glass. He has to hire some people, draw down his saving and so forth. And as a result of the pandemic, there's a lot of broken glass. There, there are uh, vast uh, components of the U.S. economy that are just uh, not going to be able to play the role that they did historically. Uh, we have more office buildings than we need now. We have a lot more retail space. Uh, there are also serious geographic imbalances. And um, as, as the economy is recovering, as it is today, and you can see that in the statistics, um, that will be captured in the GDP. However, all of the damage to the various components that were put out of business by the pandemic will not be counted as a loss. And, and because of the fallacy of the broken glass, uh, a lot of your aggregate economic indicators are, are, are not a true measure of the economy's underlying strength. And so when we take into account the, the change in technology, the resumption of supply chains, the higher level of technology, um, I think we're going to see the inflation rate come down. It's going to go up over the next next few months because a year ago we had actual deflation but as this base effect inflation wears off i think the trend in inflation is going to be decidedly downward so what is what are we to do you know i mean are we going to have you know i i said we would have inflation then deflation and i guess that's what's happening but are we going to continue to have the economy heat up real estate prices go up I mean, really everywhere we're seeing this, is this like hyperinflation before deflation or, or are we going to get zeros added by the Fed? I mean, they, they spent $9 trillion within the last 12 months where they only spent, you know, a trillion in the last crisis. Now they're just going to start adding zeros, universal basic income. I mean, I guess that's the, the counterpoint to deflation, right? That they're just going to keep printing. It, it is the counterpoint. You correctly state, you stated very well. Um, but keep in mind that um, the, this $9 trillion was all done with borrowed funds. And what we've, what we've learned, Europeans have learned, the Japanese have learned, have learned from the history of the world, that when you undertake uh, these, these programs financed with debt, the economy receives a transitory boost. Uh, the boost lasts um, one quarter, maybe maybe two quarters. But, but then the debt becomes a drain on economic activity. Let me give you a couple of examples. Um, in 2009, there were the shovel-ready projects financed with debt. They gave a boost to economic activity for, we had, about two reasonably good quarters. Uh, the tax cuts that went into effect in 2018, uh, we had one very good quarter the spring of 2018. The third quarter of 2018 was fairly good, but the growth then began tailing off. Um, and the, the net result is that when economies um, become more and more indebted, such as we are, it's, it's really um, a process of slow economic deterioration and disinflation. And we can see this in the relative performance of the major economies of the world. For example, uh, the United States is, is now more indebted than we've any, ever been in our history. Uh, however, uh, Europe, our, our, our public and private debt, everything included, is about 400% of GDP in round numbers. In Europe, it's around 500% in round numbers. And in Japan, it's around 650% in round numbers. So what, is, what has been happening, and it's, it's clearly evident that the United States is performing much worse than it has done historically. Um, from the beginning of our republic in 1800 uh, to the late 90s when we became very indebted, our real per capita GDP grew about 2.2% per annum. And since then, we've only growing, been growing 1.2% per annum. So we've lost 
almost 40% of, of, of the growth, which, which is the key to the standard of living. Just to give you an idea, if we had compounded at 2.2% since 1997, instead of 1.2, um, the, the GDP in real terms per person at the end of last year would have been 25% higher than it was. So we're, we're not measuring up. And the, and the key element that is, is pulling us down is this debt, uh, while it has this um, initial benefit, the benefit doesn't last long. And in Europe, which is where debt is about 500% of GDP, uh, they're performing even worse than we are. And in Japan, uh, where debt is approximately 650% of GDP, then they're performing worse than Europe. And so uh, these differences are, are mattering over time. It, it's one way to sort of think about it is the, the path to high debt, it leads to um, a process of slow strangulation. Uh, it, the world doesn't end with a bang, it ends with a whimper. And the, the growth just, just the, the debt just grinds us lower and lower. There are these intermediate episodes uh, such as we're experiencing now, but they don't last very long. So what do we do? Is there, a, is there any uh, hope for improvement on the horizon with expanding debt? Well, and we talked about this last year. We've talked about this for years to some degree. The tax cuts weren't uh, stimulative enough because they weren't like a 25 or 28 percent marginal tax cut. And now nine trillion later, we're still here. You know, barely at mm -hmm. at uh, you know inflation. So what? So what do we well, do? What do we do as a as a country? Like, I mean, are we going to head? Well, that, the, the the answer we the academic studies give us the answer, but the academic the answer is not politically acceptable. Um, perhaps one of the leading researchers on the debt situation is McKinsey Global Institute, part of. A McKinsey organization. And in 2010, they looked at 24 advanced economies that became extremely over indebted. They, they started when the, with the buildup of debt, the crisis situation, and then the unwinding of the problem. And they, they pointed out for the advanced economies that in all 28 cases, it had to be solved by a sustained period of austerity which uh, McKinsey defined as a significant rise in the net national saving rate, which would be the saving of the government, the household, uh, private sector, and the foreign sector. And the, the problem is in modern democracies, no one's in favor of, of um, austerity. And so whenever a crisis comes along, whatever it is, um, failure of Lehman, of recession, pandemic, the solution is to take on more debt. And it, it, you can say that it's socially responsible and say that it's politically popular. But the net result is that after this transitory lift to economic activity, the economy grinds lower, not, not higher. And so to think of it this way, when you're taking on more debt, you're living beyond your means. And if you try to solve an indebtedness problem by taking on more debt, you make yourself worse off. The solution has to be living inside one's means. And uh, I'll give you just two examples of, 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 the tw of these 28 countries where they had to use austerity. Well, let's talk about those program. examples. When we return, this is Josh Jelinski, the financial quarterback and i don't know about you but it makes me want to dust out my portfolio and review things so call us at 888-988-JOSH if you are concerned the preceding program was sponsored by the Jelinski Advisory Group. Any awards, rankings, or recognition by unaffiliated third parties or publications, including Five Star Wealth Manager, Advisory of the Year finalist by Senior Market Advisor, and Top of the Million Dollar Roundtable, are in no way indicative of the advisor's future performance or any individual client's investment success. No award, ranking, or recognition should be construed as a current or past endorsement of Josh Jelinski or Wealth Quarterback, LLC. Information regarding specific awards, rankings, or recognitions is available on the Wealth 
Health Quarterback website at www.jelinski.org. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. Investment strategies such as asset allocation, diversification, or rebalancing do not assure or guarantee better performance and cannot eliminate the risk of investment losses. There are no guarantees that a portfolio employing these or any other strategy will outperform a portfolio that does not engage in such strategies. This broadcast should not be construed by any client or prospective client as a solicitation to effect or attempt to affect transactions and securities or the rendering of personalized investment advice. Due to various factors, including changing market conditions, the information discussed in this broadcast may no longer be reflective of current positions or recommendations. While information presented is believed to be factual and up-to-date, Josh Jelinski and Wealth Quarterback do not guarantee its accuracy, and it should not be regarded as a complete analysis of the subjects discussed. The tax and estate planning information discussed is general in nature, is provided for informational purposes only, and should not be construed as legal or tax advice. Listeners should consult an attorney or tax professional regarding their specific legal or tax situation. Advisory services offered through Wealth Quarterback, LLC.